I'm sorry we lost the show in Delhi. Uh, I really did like that city, and that's really, it's a real shame what's going on there with the uh, with the air pollution. Everybody knows about the Bollywood scene, but that is so nat to us. That is so national. All we get to see is if somebody's won an award, we see an amazing two-minute dance sequence. We have never planned a date to stop working. Uh, we are realists, you know. Guys are getting older, and it's going to come come a point where maybe one of the two, one or two of us, don't want to do it anymore, or, or not physically possible for them to do it anymore. But we don't think about that. I miss the early days with Richie; they were a lot of fun. Um, but again, people change, and times change. White Snake. The reason I really lost a job there because I wasn't interested in promoting the band to the media. My job was to play drums. And that's all I was interested in. Hello, everyone. I'm Rudrani and welcome to Zoom Speak Easy. My guest today is so special. Of course, when I tell you the name, you are going to be so excited. Hands down, one of the most celebrated, legendary hard rock bands that we have. He's, of course, one of the most celebrated trevors that we have. Of course, I'm talking about Deep Purple and Ian. Hello. Thank you for joining in. I'm sure good India morning. is very excited that uh, you are joining me in today. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, but, you know, I meant every word in the introduction. Deep Purple has remained relevant for so many years, right? And y'all have actually come to India before and performed. But this time around, though, Deep Purple took some time to come back. And we are glad that you're doing it. So, first of all, you will have to tell me what, what is it that you've missed about being in India and the Indian audience and what are you looking forward to doing around this time when you come back after a really long time? Well, as you said, it's been a long time and not just the, the COVID nonsense before that, it was a long time. The, the artists are always in the hands of the promoters. Uh, if the promoters think they can do business, you will get an offer. But I do remember... Uh, the amazing audiences on the concerts we did there last time. And it's it's sort of surprising when you've got a, a style of Western music which moves to a totally different culture and it has an effect on them very similar to the, to the way it does in, in Europe and North America and South America. And that sort of, it opens your eyes a little bit how, how valuable, valuable people treat some modern music. You know, I think Paul McCartney said the other day, popular music today is the classical music of today. You know, it, it, if you think about it logically, what went on two, three hundred years ago was their pop music. Now it's this music. But anyway, coming back to India, it'll be wonderful. I'm sorry we lost the show in Delhi. Uh, I really did like that city. And that's really, it's a real shame what's going on there with the... Uh, with the air pollution, but uh, you can't do those lives for a two-hour rock and roll show. You can't do that. No, but like I asked, you haven't told me yet, what have you missed about being in, in our country and the Indian audience when you performed on stage? I'm, I'm sorry, I walked around there, didn't I? Um, <laughs> I, th I, think, I think it's the difference. Every time you go somewhere different, uh, things that are basically strange to you, uh, after a couple of days, they're not so strange. And it is the change of culture. It is the different way of living. Obviously, the food is different. You know, we all know about Indian food. And uh, the rules of living are different. And you have to learn that very quickly. If, if you're in an app for one day, you know, it doesn't really affect you so much. But when you're there for a little while, you have to understand that the way your culture has developed, different from ours, and you find things that uh, always surprise you. And usually in a good way. I mean, the, uh, the way that the society works there, and it does work, is totally different to here. And you see how people get along very, very well. And sometimes in, in the Western world, it's not quite the same way. You know, and we, we have a lot of dif different situations to deal with. Yes. And it's wonderful that so many people can actually just make it work, you know. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm, I love that uh, you like that about India, that we 
we are, we have we are different cultures and we're all together all the time thank you uh, but more importantly also uh, what are you looking forward to doing here when you once come anything any food any places that you really want to visit this time but when we come to uh, any country which has a famous cuisine we have to forget that we what we think of indian food in england is slightly different to what indian food is in india to say we went to china once and we were expecting it to be like english chinese food it's not it's different you know the the, the recipes are changed for the different palates of yeah. people there so that's interesting too you know you think you can get one thing and you get something else and usually it's wonderful you know so that's again that's that surprise as well um yeah you have to remember that we don't actually get a lot of time to be tourists mm. you know there's no way you can say oh, i'm going to take a day and go and see this wonderful uh, museum or this wonderful park here or the taj mahal or whatever you just don't have that time uh because even though you're only playing on stage for maybe an hour and a half two hours the build up to the day takes time uh doing things like this takes time and you know you you just keep telling yourself you're there doing your work you're not there as a tourist so i said to somebody the other day i must have been around the world 20 times i've seen nothing you know That's i see a, i see an airport i see a hotel i see a concert hall i go back to an airport <laughs> people think you have all this time you see everything but you just don't you don't maybe when you come next time only to just travel in india and we shall give you some suggestions fantastic but i'd like to repeat what i just said some time back the purple remains from the most loved uh, most respected hard rock bands in the world and of course staying relevant for such a long time ian is not easy right your music has transcended generations and has been loved across generations today they pass it on like you pass on the most precious thing your cd's have been passed on right um yeah. but i would like to know how do you analyze this how do you analyze what all of you have managed to do with the hard rock scene staying rock solid and pun intended in that yeah. and uh, also uh where do you think your strengths lie in because you've been able to do this today um i think the the strength of purple and we we've made some nice records yeah we've made some nice records and they've been very well loved by by the world but the strength of purple has always been on stage we've always been blessed with um virtuoso players not just one not just two but three or four and that helps you create something which for other bands is a little more difficult and that can make music more interesting doesn't mean to say it's better or I'm just saying it's different and i think some of that musical quality uh takes it somewhere else and allows it to be listened to 10 20 years later uh and get the interest of the listener with some of the more simple tunes especially the pop stuff it's it's here today and it's gone not the great pop stuff the great stuff pop stuff I, even now when i'm driving i turn the radio up you know but there is a difference in in the music that purple plays uh but i've also i also believe we've also we've always respected the fact that when we do go on stage we have to give 100% of what, of what we have that night it's not the same every night you know if it was the same every night it would be like a machine mm -hmm. so you have nights where things are difficult but you do your best and you have nights where things are incredibly easy and wonderful uh and you can never guarantee which one's going to turn up but people always realize that when when they see they're going to get everything we've got there's nothing left in the tank when it finishes mm. well said and because you mentioned that and you're an integral part of the brand you always have been so as that band member how would you describe or what would you describe as one of your most difficult time for the band that you guys survived together and rose above it and became only stronger mm. well as everybody knows there's been eruptions in the band from time to time where somebody's come somebody's gone somebody's been fired uh, they they're very very difficult you wake up in the morning 
and you're in a happy place. You've got a band which is successful. You're enjoying yourself. And in the afternoon, you don't have a band. That is very, very difficult to deal with, especially if it's happened uh, without your control. You're sort of on the side of it and it's happened around you. That's really, really tough. And those, those periods where you're not quite sure whether it's just gone bang or you have the chance to, to rethink it and put it back together again. That, that period is very difficult. Of course, if you do manage to put it back together again, it becomes very satisfying. But they're the hardest point when you had it and then you don't got it. Very nicely said. Um, but Ian, you have been the constant in the band, right? From the inception, you, uh, with all due respect, I think you're the backbone of the band because you've been there. You've been there when when the name was supposed to be given, how it came, everything. Um, and But you've also done it very, very quietly. You know, you've never been the one who's going all, all out to do too much stuff, seeing a lot about yourself or what you're doing. You've been doing it very quietly and you're actually kind of okay with not getting so much limelight. I'd like you to tell me, how do you look at this conversation when they say that Ian deserves way more credit than he ever got? And, um, you know, that's, he's just remained un, uh, under uh, understated and underrated. How do you look at that debate? Um, I think you could put 10 drummers doing this at the same time and they'd all say the same thing they don't care you know uh, we're at the back of the stage we've chosen an instrument through the just natural ability or the love of it which doesn't require us to be the voice the face of an outfit there are a few guys who uh, take it to the other extreme yeah of course there are <laughs> uh, but i think it's in the nature of most of us who do sit at the back of the stage that we, we see everything and we take a more pragmatic view about how what things should be done better, what things are not working right, because we see everything. And I think it's in the nature. But I also think there are far more great players out there, drummers, than there are great seats to sit in. You know, So if you are lucky enough through talent, through being in the right place at the right time, to find one of those jobs, most of us don't throw it away. And we will cling on to it, you know, tooth and nail to make sure that we, we try and hold it together. Then never, never take it for granted and never treat it with disrespect. You know, that's, I think that's the important thing. And it's in your nature whether you need to be seen in the clubs every night, you know, <laughs> out with a different lady every night. If that's in your nature, fine. If it's not, then don't try and be something you're not. <clears throat> I remember when I was with uh, White Snake, the reason I really lost a job there because I wasn't interested in promoting the band for the media. My job was to play drums, and that's all I was interested in. Sure, I'd do an interview and stuff, but it wasn't my job to be making the tabloid press every night. Totally not interested. I think that's 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 me. That's you, and we love you for who you are. The rock music scene has definitely evolved today. How how do you look at that? How do you look at the evolution of rock today? How do you find the rock music today? Um, and you know, and the massive changes that have come across, both good and bad. And what is it that you miss about the hard rock scene from the seventies? Well, at the beginning, back then, you know. We were all kids, and like most kids, uh, life is exciting. Every day is exciting. You know, you're immortal, you're bulletproof. It's Life is being good to you. Um, and the music business has always been a business. From the first artist who signed a contract with a manager or an agent or a record company, it's about business. But when we started, there were so many guys, especially in the recording side, who controlled the big labels, who actually liked music and actually had a musical ear. And they could pick out what they thought was good, different, interesting, and put time into promoting it. There's very, very few of those guys left now. There's a couple, 
we're lucky we work with one. Uh, so it's down, it's all, it's, the world has changed into a corporate entity. Some of the people running these major art form companies have no interest in it. Their one job is to make sure that it, it's a black number at the end of the year, not a red number. And they are somewhat faceless. You don't meet them because you have nothing in common. They may be promoting something they can't stand. Maybe they don't like rock music, but they might be the head of a rock label. So that's changed. It, it almost seemed like it was almost a cottage industry back when we started. A select few people who really enjoyed what they were doing. Now you're just part of a major corporation. And that's the world today, you know. Um, we can't change it. We have to live with it. But I, <sighs> the business size was a little more friendly back when we started. Just as cutthroat, <laughs> you know, most most kids sign contracts that they're looking at now and they go, you idiot, where did you sign that? <laughs> you know? Uh -huh. So as I said, it's always been about business, but there were there were more people involved who actually enjoyed the business they were in. And I, I do miss that. Smoke on the Water has been such an iconic track that every time it plays in any club today, at any place, you know, the crowd just goes crazy. It's a track that has been a uh, crowd favorite for generations and will continue to be. But there is also a very interesting story behind the song that I know. And I think uh, it'll be really interesting to know the process of when you made that iconic song, what happened when you were trying to record the video and all of that. But I'd like you to tell the story, please. Well, the track itself was the first thing we recorded uh, when we were in Montreux. And we were just, we were in a, a big old ballroom next to the hotel we were staying in. Um, we were just trying to get a sound for the man in the, for Martin Birch in the recording truck. And we just had this riff, this song, which you called it the Da Da song, you know, because there are no words. I thought, well, let's try that. So we ran it through two or three times and it was quite late at night. And Montre in the winter, it's not like a, a Swiss skiing village. It's a summer resort. Nice little mountains and people go walking there, you know. So the noise coming out of this this big old ballroom was a little bit too much for the local the local ladies and gentlemen to do. with. So they called the police and the police came along and tried to break in. So we managed to get the, the road manager stopped the police coming in long enough for us to finish the track. Uh, so they said, you have to stop. And we stopped and then we had nowhere to record. And our good friend, Claude Nobbs, who unfortunately died a, a few years ago, uh, he managed to find us somewhere else. So then we recorded the rest of the, 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 the ideas we had, which were far more complete. And at the end of the session, we thought the record is one song short. It's, it needs an, it's too, the, the album's not long enough. I said, well, what about that first track we did, the first one, before we got thrown out of the ballroom? I said, oh, we'll have a listen to it. That yeah, sounds all right. But what are we going to do? There's no lyrics, there's no words. But Ian Gillan and Roger Glover were thinking about it. And the idea of why don't we tell the story of the recording? So that's what they did. And the, the Glover, uh, the uh, title came from Roger when the, when the casino was burning down. Um, I said, look at that. The downdraft from the mountains was hitting the smoke, taking it down across the lake. Look at that smoke on the water. And Gillen went, oh, we'll write that down. And it sort of started from that. But the chaos that happened uh, with the casino burning down led to all that. So out of something tragic for us, something very magical happened. You know? That song, on the face of it, is very simplistic. But to make it work properly was a little more difficult. And that's why you get other bands copy it. It's never quite the same. Uh, but I'm glad we we have that. I'll be totally honest. That that song has provided a great livelihood for our families. And hopefully it will continue to do so. But you look back, it was 10, <coughs> 10 12 minutes 
of our life when we recorded the track and then forgot about it. And as long as it took Ian and Roger to write the words, probably another 20 minutes to sing the song. And uh, we, we didn't think about it. It was just another track on the app. Yeah. It was the DJ in America started playing it, but he said it's, they couldn't get a lot, like it was too long, five minutes, something. So the guy at the record company put his razor blade out and edited it and took it down to three minutes. So you could buy the single and you get the full version on the other side or the short version on the, on the A side. And that's how it took off. The radio, plays, radio station started to play it. Kids locked into it. And it's still here today. Absolutely. But it's pure chance. We were going to throw it away. It was just a, just a, a practice rehearsal for us. <laughs> I'm just I'm just glad that happened. There have mm. always been on and off rumors about this being like the last tour of the brand. This time around, so in the beginning, they were like this year, the ones that you're doing is going to be the last tour. They're retiring. Deep Purple is retiring from touring. Um, but of course, I always believe when the person involved tells me that to believe it. So you'll have to tell me if there's any truth to it. If not, of course, we're delighted. And if not, you'll have to tell me what would be the most epic way for you to have that last tour. Um, we have never planned a date to stop working. Uh, we are realists, you know, guys are getting older and it's going to come, come a point where maybe one, of a two, one or two of us don't want to do it anymore. Or, or not physically possible for them to do it anymore. But we don't think about that. We're still having a great deal of fun. A lot of people still enjoy what we do. And as long as those two things stay in harmony, we'll continue. Um, I don't think we'll ever know what the last gig, what the last tour is. I think it'll jump and just smack us in the face. You know, um, and I, unless there's a, a definite plan, which there isn't, uh, to do something as a final bye-bye. I just think it will just go, sorry, sorry, guys, we finished. You know, we can't do it anymore. It's been wonderful. Um, but even then, I think if we stopped touring, there's no reason why we couldn't make more records. That's the easiest thing in the world. All you've got to do is have the ideas. Yeah. That's the hardest thing in the world. But physically making a record is easy. Uh, and touring only works if you enjoy it. You can't just enjoy the two hours a night when you're playing. You've got to be able to deal with the whole thing. You've got to be able to deal with a 10-hour flight, a hotel which is less than perfect, transportation which goes wrong. You've got to deal with all that. And if you can and still enjoy it, then why would you stop something that you got into as a kid because it made you happy? And if it still makes you happy, why would you stop it? Why would you do that? Indeed. That gives me so much hope. Good. I have some fun, quick questions. Shall I go ahead? You can give some quick, short answers. Whatever comes to your mind first. I will. Okay. Are you ready? I am. How would you describe India? A mystery. A glorious mystery. For us, in the, well, for me in the UK, uh, and well, we have a massive Indian population, I know very little about them. But when you go there, you see where the differences are, and how glorious the differences are. We're not all meant to be the same. You know, we're not, we're not meant to like the same things, hate the same things, believe the same things. That's what makes yeah. it work, really. It, that's not what pairs us apart. That's what makes it work. Sure. Which Indian artists and movies have you been introduced to? Um, I had the great privilege of uh, being a friend of George Harrison, and he had the wonderful Ravi Shankar, and his family and his troop of musicians there at his house two or three times. Uh, and I, I, I've seen the best. I lose interest in the rest. But yeah, so any any Indian movies, if you ever found the time, I know you're, you're you know, are there anything that you've seen? Now, all we get over here, I mean, everybody knows about the Bollywood scene, but that is so, to us, that is so national. All we get to see is if somebody's won an award, we see an amazing two-minute dance sequence. But, of course, <laughs> they're generally in Hindi, and we don't understand the word. So it's a little bit of a mystery to us. Um, but the, uh, there's no doubting the success of it. Yeah. You know, it's been going a long time and very successful. 
And as, again, it's wonderfully different. But you, you, you see how wonderfully well it's done, the professionalism of it. So, yeah. I, I, I will suggest some if you're ever interested. And it's so much more beyond just the dancing. You know, it's amazing. Um, but, yeah. Which Indian artist currently, if you're aware of, would you really love collaborating with? Well, I don't know the names because I can never really pronounce them. But uh, I see some wonderful drummers in dealing in rhythms that I can't even I can't even contemplate, you know. And the way that the the different sounds mean different timings. And there are so many of you guys here. And to a Western to a Western percussionist, where our our rhythms are fairly simple: one beat, two beat, three beat, four beat, five beat, a mixture of those. Your guys are working in twenty nine, thirty two beats, it's, uh -huh. and it is. And it's not just one guy doing it. There's five or six of them all doing it together. And that is astounding. Um, <laughs> so, but I can never remember their names. There's so many of them because you, you, you watch a television and then their credits go up and they go so fast. You're, you can't <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Which bandmate do you miss the most and why? Uh, obviously, I miss John Lord a lot. You know, we're sort of related by marriage to two twin sisters. And uh, John was always there until he decided not to be there when he wanted to go and write his classical music um so i miss him a lot uh, i miss the early days with richie they were a lot of fun um but again people change and times change and it's just it suddenly it's not the same um i think yeah those two guys okay you'll have to fill in the blanks for me complete the sentence Deep Purple remains one of the most celebrated rock bands today because? Because it's good and it's interesting. Ah, uh, I love that. Okay. Mm. What has been your craziest fan experience? Um, well, I'm not sure he was a fan, but he was having a very good time. I think we were playing in oh, Oklahoma or Cincinnati some, somewhere. And in the middle of the drum solo, some, some guy started to be a cowboy and start waving a pistol around like this and go, yeehaw, and the damp, the gun went off. Big handgun, great big thing like that. And the bullet went about three meters above my head, direct into the, into the concrete wall. Oh, uh, my God. And the, and the roadies and the police jumped on him and took him away. But, it, you know, I just think he was, he was having too much of a good time. In, and he yeah. made sure I never had a good time again. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really scary and cannot happen. Oh, and yeah. gun violence yeah. is absolutely scary. I don't mind if it never happens again. It's okay. Please, yes, absolutely. <laughs> that should never happen again. Okay, any international artists from different genres that that you've always thought it'd be so interesting to collaborate with? You know. Um, well, of course there are. You know, if, if you if you are a musician, you hear you see other great musicians playing something different. Sure. Um, I mean, one that one of the guys I never got to play with, but I almost got to play with, was Jimi Hendrix. Uh, we were in a nightclub in New York. There was my friend Carmen Apis from Vanilla Fudge, with myself, a couple of other guys, and Hendrix was there just having a drink. And then the band stopped playing, and somebody said, "Why didn't you have a jam?" So everybody went, yeah, sure, that's great. So we got up there. And my friend Carmine said, I'll go first, and you 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 take up after. So I said, fine. But Carmine started having such a great time, he wouldn't get off the kit. So I didn't get to play with Jim. So that was that. But my other loves are made mostly from the jazz world. A big band era. Uh, I love the, the punk tune, big band drumming. I love the swing a bit. People like Gene Krupa. Dave Tough, Buddy Rich. Uh, they are magician, magicians to me. I see what they do and I try and copy some of it. That's fantastic. Okay. What are your tour rituals? You know, things that you must do or the, as a band that you guys do before going on stage uh, or things that you must have in your tour bus that that is something that you, you know, it's kind of become a ritual. So tell us a little on that. Well, I don't do tour buses. I hate the damn. I never do. I will fly everywhere. I, I hate okay. taking eight hours to do a one hour trip. So I don't yeah. do that. My needs on the road are very, very simple. Um, 
simple food in the dressing room. Uh, I do have a drink before I'm on stage. One, one drink. I usually have a, a Jack Daniels and Coke. And that just loosened it a bit without losing control. Uh, if I have two, it's not a great idea. I'll have the second one after the show. Um, no, uh, my needs are fairly simple. Other guys, I mean, Ian Gillen likes solitude before the gig. He has, it, we, he has his own dressing room. We're happy with that. It, whatever makes you happy makes the, makes it the concert work for you. That's fine. So Ian has his own thing. He has his own little routine, which uh, he needs to go through. Most of us don't. You know, we, we we have times when we, okay, it's 30 minutes before the show, get changed. 20 minutes before the show, have the drink. Five minutes before, get mentally primed. Just do it. Uh, I know some guys need to have special color sweeties. And then, oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 not for me. It's a very simple routine for us. I think because we've been doing it so long, I think you've got all those stupid things out of your system. Because when you look back, there were some stupid things there, you know. Uh, <laughs> but you just, you, know, you grow out of it. You grow out of saying, well, I want this, that, and I want that now. And, you know, you realise you're actually just being dumb. <laughs> Jean, what has been your most favourite and the least favourite track? Um, I could I could pick out three or four tracks from the In Rock record okay. where I think I, I did a good job. And that's the way I look at it. If I did a good job on a track, I, I, I disassociate myself from the actual song. I look at my performance. I think I could do it a hundred times more. I wouldn't do it better. And they're the ones I'm happy with. The ones I don't really like are the ones I don't think I did a good job. Uh, it was I was either uninspired, uh, it's probably the best I could do in the day, or I didn't like the song, you know. And there are lots of them, uh, but I, I take myself aside when I look at my favorite tracks. It's about what I did, not what everybody else did. Yeah, because it's my legacy, not you know. My I'm not involved with the guitar solo. I'm not involved with the lyrics. Okay, which artist continued to inspire? Fire you and also other members of Deep Purple. I don't know about the other guys. I know that Roger, Roger, our, our resident hippie, he's a, he's a huge Bob Dylan fan. Always has been and always will be. Yeah. Uh, Gillen was a massive Elvis, Elvis Presley fan. Uh, much more than that, I don't know about their musical knowledge because we don't we don't talk about it that much. You know, I know that those two guys, that's their main uh, influences. Um, what about you? Well, mine are all drummers, uh, or what you might call the classic jazz singers. Uh, see, when I was growing up, my father was a musician. He was a piano player, very good one. And a whole, all his music was in the house. There was very little rock and roll on British radio, none on TV, virtually. None. And so all the music I heard of him was what he would put on the record player. That'd be Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, uh, yeah. Dinah Washington, and all this stuff, you know. And so those influences go in when you're a kid. And you, you always appreciate how good it was. Mm. Okay, different generations of music, but how good it was. And when I started to play, that, that beauty of that great 30s, 40s stuff, the, the cleverness of the music, the genius of the composition, the brilliance of the artists, it never goes away, and it's I still love it to this day. So I listen to a lot more of that than I do to rock and roll. Could you tell me if you could dissociate yourself and your performance in it? If you could say, according to you, an almost perfect favorite album of Deep Purple would be Made in Japan, the live one, yeah, because uh, it's an honest representation of a, a newish band, two three years old at the height of its powers, uh, playing with absolute freedom, with a great recorded sound to an audience that had never seen it before. And the, the, the atmosphere that's created by all that stuff together makes it amazing. And that album is still uh, truly wonderful today, 50 years after it was made. Uh, right. I don't know if there's been a better rock album ever recorded by anybody. 
there have been prettier ones. There have been more raucous ones, but I don't think there's been a better one. Okay. I hope everybody listening in will again go and listen to that, what he just suggested. It'll be wonderful. So, a one-line advice. Just one line advice to all the rock enthusiasts or, or young rock bands that have come in today. From your years of experience, what would you tell them? First of all, remember why you why you started. You'd started because it made you happy. You loved it. Never lose that. Don't let anybody try and change what you think is right. Even if you just end up playing for yourself, stay true to your heart. And if it works out right for you, great. If it doesn't, you'll still be happy doing what you want to do. Don't change for anybody. That's excellent advice. Thank you so much. I truly, truly enjoyed chatting with you. Uh, before I let you go, I must uh, ask you, would you like to tell the ones who are uh, listening and watching right now uh, to the interview about what they can find soon? What are the things that they might, uh, you know, get to listen to to the upcoming tour in, in Bangalore to your performance. What do you well, think is going to happen there? And of course, about the show that you're going to put up. Yeah. Uh, live shows are always a problem when you've got a lot of music because you know there are five or six songs that you have to play. That's what people bought the ticket to see. But the other thing is to, to in between those very famous big songs, is put some songs that are less famous, but you still, still think are interesting and good. So you have this uh, problem of blending all these things together because no matter what you do, when you've got a catalogue of 100 songs or something, you're never going to please everybody. Somebody's always going to say, well, why didn't you play that one? Well, we didn't. We played something else. <laughs> so that's that. Um, we do have another record somewhere in the, in the production process. When it will be released, I have no idea. Until It's not finished yet. It's one of those things. If we think it's good enough, we'll release it. And if we don't, we'll throw it away. We'll see how it goes. But uh, the, there's a, a chance of new, new music sometime in the future. And the tours we're already booking next year. So we're not going anywhere yet. Thank God for that. Thank you so much, Ian. I'm sure everybody's really excited to see you guys uh, perform here in Bengaluru, in India. India loves you. I love you. Thank you so much for always contributing so much to music. And thank you for your honesty. Sending you lots of love. Thanks a lot. We're looking forward to being there. Sure. Bye-bye. Bye, baby. Bye.